The space shuttle is also built around one because it provides great lift. But neither the shuttle nor the SR-71 are exactly agile. A Delta design pays a price in speed when executing turns. And the control surfaces near the tail don't have the leverage to turn the plane sharply. European designers have overcome these handicaps in their new fighter, the Typhoon, by adding canards near the front of the plane. But in the US, Delta fighters have been out of favor for decades, until the JSF picked the Boeing design as a finalist. Why the new interest? Deltas can be cheap to build. Boeing took a step back and said, what makes aeroplanes expensive? How can we leave it out? And they got a very, very simple design. Boeing's expertise in wings has, has kind of taken a different tack. Our engineers have chosen to build this wing as one piece from tip to tip. We have always studied the idea of building a one piece wing and attaching the fuselage to the wing. And so this time we had an opportunity to really try it. Boeing has taken to heart the JSF concept, meeting the needs of the Air Force, Navy, and Marines through a versatile common design. And it even accommodates the biggest JSF challenge, landing like a Harrier. While it gets a bad rap for safety, the Harrier is no doubt the most adaptable fighter ever built. Matching its capabilities will drive many of the design decisions of the competition. When fully loaded with fuel and bombs, a Harrier takes off in as little as 500 feet, a third of that needed by most fighters. That short takeoff distance makes many roads into potential runways. After an attack, it returns, a lighter fighter, ready to execute its trademark Buck Rogers move. A Harrier hovers using rotating nozzles that direct engine exhaust downward. This mode of flight, called direct lift, demands an enormous amount of power. And it's dangerous. Before computer control, balancing a Harrier on its own engine thrust was like trying to sit on a geyser. Even today, its accident rate is four times that of a Navy Hornet. But through their flexibility, Harriers have proven their value. In fact, in the Gulf War, Harriers flew more missions than any other kind of fighter. For the British, the Harrier remains essential. British aircraft carriers are smaller than their American counterparts. The Harrier's short takeoff ability overcomes the problem and creates a portable fighter force. The Harrier has allowed the UK basically to be where it couldn't be. The Falcons was a classic example. I mean, without the Harrier, we could not have defended the Falcons. We couldn't have got anybody, any aircraft down there. But the ability to put a, a reasonably competent combat aircraft onto a deck and get it down there and then fight was just the difference between success and failure. But the Harrier can't fly supersonic, a serious limitation in a modern fighter. In terms of its turn performance, its range and endurance, its maximum speed, Whichever metric you want to look at, it fares unfavorably with any modern aeroplane. We also have brothers in arms with the uh, US Navy, so from the American The British but, search for a replacement uh, Harrier brings them to the JSF table. I think they become full partners. The it's the first time a foreign government has been included in an American fighter development program. The addition of the British only heightens what many consider the central technical challenge of the JSF competition landing the fighter vertically. Alternatives to the Harrier's direct lift system have been studied by both contractors, but Boeing has come to a surprising conclusion. 
over the years, all contractors have looked at all of these various lift methods and the least impact of the design always and has been direct lift. The Boeing lift system is basically uh, the modern version of the Harrier. Taking the engine thrust and putting it through a pair of nozzles that direct it downwards. The advantage that Boeing has is that you basically strap on the lift module around the engine, so the changes are, are pretty minimal. The fewer the changes between the marine fighter and the other versions, the better the bottom line. Boeing has made an ally of affordability. So I believe when we're all finished doing a flight test, we'll have proven that direct lift offers the absolute greatest affordability because of the greatest commonality. While direct lift is affordable, other parts of the plane must pay a price. For balance during hover, the engine must be in the middle. That leads to a gaping inlet to feed it air. To some, Boeing has designed a plane only its mother could love. It's a strange looking aeroplane. It's short, it's squat, the engine's in the front, not the back. It has this huge air inlet in front that reminds me of a hippopotamus. This is a fighter competition, not a beauty pageant. But there is an adage in aerospace that if it looks right, it flies right. And appearance may be a deciding factor. Appearance aside, Boeing's proposal is a cunning entry for the JSF competition. Throwing over fighter tradition, the company delivers a radical but simple design that promises to be cheap to build. Boeing's ready to give its aerospace opponent a flight to the finish. When I daydream, I see it hovering, I see it taking off from uh, airfields, I see it operating around the ship, and sometimes I even see it uh, shooting down the Lockheed airplane. Only in your dreams is the likely response of Lockheed Martin, America's largest defense contractor. For decades in this secret facility in California, the legendary Skunk Works, Lockheed has designed and built aircraft that have blown through the boundaries of imagination. The Lockheed Skunk Works reputation is founded on its ability to put together a small team of very motivated people, get everybody else out of the way, and leave them to solve a problem that everybody else thinks can't be solved. The whole history of this place has been, there is nothing that we can't do, there is no project that we can't accomplish. There's a, a huge amount of pride of, we can do anything. We've done that. We've done that. By the time Lockheed earns its place in the final JSF competition, Chief Engineer Rick Rezebeck and his team have already spent five years designing their fighter. Now they must build a pair of test planes in just two. If Lockheed wins, their work will live on for decades. If it loses... The stakes are horrendous on this. This program will end up uh, running from today out through the year 2050, long after my retirement, the performance of this team and the decision-making that goes on during these next two years are very key. The mystique of the Skunk Works remains unrivaled in aviation. It's the birthplace of America's first operational jet fighter, the P-80. In the 50s and 60s, this covert design house created the ultimate spy planes for the CIA, the high-flying U-2 and the high-velocity SR-71 Blackbird. Later for the Air Force, it built the F-117 Nighthawk, the first stealth fighter. Unveiled to the public during the Gulf War, the Nighthawk was the only U.S. aircraft to strike targets in downtown Baghdad. The image of anti-aircraft guns aimlessly blazing away at invisible attackers is a surreal salute to its success, and that of the Skunk Works. They've conducted many of their most advanced programs in complete secrecy, such that nobody else in the world even had a clue what they were up to. 
it's got to be very, very scary going up against those guys. The F-117 sacrifices speed and handling for stealth. It's been superseded by the current gold standard of American fighters, the F-22 Raptor, built by Lockheed. While very expensive, and not the all-in-one fighter for the JSF, the Raptor provides a wealth of proven design ideas, including a radical new shape for stealth. It's no surprise the Lockheed design for the JSF inherits the Raptor's contours. Built around one common airframe, Lockheed's proposed fighter is modified for each service. Most visibly, the Navy model has a larger wing and tail for carrier landings. The exterior design of Lockheed's fighter holds few surprises. On the surface, it looks like the company doesn't want to gamble. It's on the inside for the Marine's vertical landing requirement that Lockheed's bet the farm. The company's gone with a daring new propulsion system known as a lift fan. The lift fan has been a engineering challenge because there has not been a lift fan built before. In the lift fan design, the engine sits in the usual fighter position in the tail. A drive shaft connects it to a large fan placed behind the pilot. To hover, engine exhaust is directed downward. But the fan is also engaged, taking in air from above the plane and blowing it out below. That creates two balanced sources of thrust, potentially a more powerful and stable arrangement than the Boeing solution. But to accomplish this feat, the drive shaft must be spun at an incredible rate. Think of taking the propulsion system in a Navy destroyer, shrinking that down into a smaller package, putting it into a jet fighter airplane. It's a technological challenge in the tradition of the Skunk Works. If successful, the lift fan will be revolutionary. But on the drawing boards, it doesn't blow away its critics. It's a very clever solution, but it's got gears and bearings and a lot of moving parts. And in an operational airplane, you've got to make sure they work 100% of the time. If you're a pilot hovering at 50 feet and one of those parts fails, it's going to spoil your day. Despite its complexity, the lift fan offers another benefit, invisible to the JSF sensors and test equipment, but plain to the naked eye, aesthetics. You can look at the Lockheed Martin airplane and say, that looks like what I would expect a modern, high-performance, high-capable jet fighter to look like. You look at the Boeing airplane and the general reaction is, I don't get it. Lockheed will build its test planes the same way it's built its successful prototypes of the past, as handcrafted machines, here in the Skunk Works. This facility provides a well-worn path to winning the JSF competition. Lockheed will try to triumph through daring new technology. Just like Legos. While Boeing tries to win with a bold, cost-saving design, combined with manufacturing know-how second to none. You couldn't have a more interesting competition. Two very different companies, two very different designs. A conservative heavyweight against a radical newcomer. If Lockheed wins, it continues its decades of fighter manufacture. If Boeing wins, it could go on to dominate the fighter market like it dominates the airliner market. I think we'll look back at this time, at this competition between Boeing and Lockheed, and I think it will be remembered as the Great Fighter War. The next battle of the fighter war will feature close combat. Less than a mile away from the Skunk Works, is Boeing's top secret complex, the Phantom Works. And these two classified installations, the JSF competition is ready for takeoff. The schedule will be fierce by aerospace standards. In 24 months and on a budget of a billion dollars, each company must build and fly not one, but two experimental planes. Adding to the tension, Boeing and Lockheed will remain in the dark about each other's progress. 
Nova is among the select few cleared to enter both facilities. It's footage locked away each night by security personnel. Boeing may not have built a fighter since the 1930s, but from day one, the company rolls out innovations to simplify the job. This scaffolding holds the parts as they arrive. The team uses lasers to position each component precisely in three-dimensional space without having to wait for surrounding pieces. The parts themselves are designed so precisely that they fit together like puzzle pieces with hardly any adjustment. Techniques like this lead Boeing to claim it can reduce assembly costs by as much as 75%. It's a very interesting process, very new. Boeing's ability to demonstrate how the aeroplane is put together is certainly a plus, and that will weigh in their favor. The frame for the single massive delta wing, the heart of the Boeing design, is already in the works. But the skin that will cover it is being cooked up over a thousand miles away at Boeing's headquarters in Seattle. After we put the pad up on, we'll probably need to cut it. Engineer yeah. George Bible yes. has spent the last year experimenting with a revolutionary material for the surface of the wings. It's a resin and carbon fiber mix called thermoplastic. In small quantities, it's been used on fighters before, but no one has ever tried to create anything as large as a 30-foot wing skin. It's very challenging. We have no time or schedule to design something else, so we, we have to make it work the first shot. Thermoplastic wings will be lighter and more durable than conventional wings. There may even be other undiscovered benefits. According to another engineer who first experimented with the material in the 80s, Frank Statkis. I personally would love to have thermoplastics on this airplane because I know that there's value in the future. Even though I can't tell you in all the areas where we might find that value, I do know it's there. The future, in a word, thermoplastics. But right now, George Bible needs to solve some pressing problems. Making thermoplastic begins with these sheets of graphite, also known as carbon fiber the same lightweight material used in fishing rods and tennis rackets. For the wing, it's laid down up to 90 layers deep on top of a giant metal mold, or tool. We take layers of these graphite fibers and set them on top of each other, and then we put the resin in between to hold them together. After three weeks of layup, the wing skin is tightly wrapped in protective bags ready for the next step, a massive oven called the autoclave. The huge chamber acts like a pressure cooker. The, the autoclave for me is always the most stressful part. You have nightmares at night thinking about all the terrible things your autoclave could do to it. First, all oxygen will be removed to prevent a cataclysmic explosion. Then, with the wing heated to the melting point of lead, nitrogen will be pumped in, raising the pressure and exerting tons of force upon the thermoplastic, forcing the fibers to blend with the resin. Very good. But this skin is only the first. Boeing will need three more, one for each side of its two delta-winged X-planes. And although Bible is elated at his success, he knows that the next skin, for the lower wing, will be far trickier. It involves a more complex curved shape. And in fact, when the next skin emerges from the autoclave, 
the first signs are ominous. Creases and folds on the surface hint at hidden structural flaws. Man, that does not look good, those wrinkles. I'm afraid we're dead in the water. 